Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MedGuru CDB YouTube channel for medical students, doctors, and doctors to be. We're going to go over some of the things which I see in my crystal ball would most likely come out in a standard anatomy exam. We're going to talk about the nerves of the upper extremities, particularly the brachial plexus. And this is how the usual medical student would go over the reality of studying nerves. Now, some salient features. We have your herbs point. So herbs point is this area here, which is just located near the C6 transverse process. So herbs point is approximately two to three centimeters above the clavicle. And this is anterior or in front of cervical six transverse process. Now, what is the significance of your herbs point? This is the most superficial passage of the brachial plexus. Now, most students would memorize the entire brachial plexus. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're preparing for an exam and you need final tips, simply remind yourself that the brachial plexus starts at cervical five and it ends in thoracic one. So again, where does the brachial plexus start? At cervical five or C5. And where does it end? At thoracic one. Now, also remember this for your examination. C5 to C6, which is cervical five and cervical six, this is considered as the upper brachial plexus. While C8 to T1, that is C8 to T1, this is considered the lower brachial plexus. Now, this is what we anticipate in the exam. Herb's palsy is an upper brachial plexus palsy, which is going to affect cervical five and cervical six. As you can see in this picture, this is the classic herb's palsy or the waiter's tip. So this is upper brachial plexus, which we mentioned earlier, is C5 to C6, and this is the famous waiter's tip. Now, what about Klumke's palsy? This is your lower brachial plexus, therefore, it would be C8 to T1. Now, next, the wrist drop. This wrist drop is due to injury of the radial nerve. And radial nerve palsy is also known as Saturday night palsy. And don't forget the clinical manifestations. There's going to be loss of extension of the fingers, the thumbs, and the wrists. That's your classic wrist drop. And there's going to be numbness over the first dorsal interosseous muscle. Now, when would we encounter a wrist drop or a radial nerve injury? That is when there is a fracture of the humeral shaft. And I'd like to specify it's the shaft of the humerus and not the surgical neck. Now, as you can see in this illustration, if you have a mid shaft fracture, okay, mid shaft or humeral shaft fracture, it is the radial nerve that will most likely be injured and your patient will clinically manifest with a wrist drop. Now, this is the median nerve distribution. It starts from the thumb, which is finger number one, the index finger, the middle finger, and half of the ring finger. This is the median nerve. Now, the APAN is the physical exam finding when you have median nerve injury. So the median nerve would supply the thinner eminence and atrophy of the thinner eminence would give you your ape hand. Now here, as you can see, this is the classic atrophy of the thinner eminence, which we call the ape hand. Memorize that for your exam. Now carpal tunnel syndrome, this is actually the most common entrapment syndrome, wherein it is the median nerve which is compressed. Now, something else to take to the exam, your Pope's blessing, okay, which is injury of the median nerve and 
the physical exam findings we do to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome. So if you tap the area of where the median nerve should be, you're going to get a numbness, a tingling, a paresthesia, or pain running down the distribution of the median nerve. This is your tinal sign. This is diagnostic of carpal tunnel syndrome. So letter T, tinal, is letter T to tap the median nerve. And here's another illustration showing you that physical exam finding. Now, we have another means to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome at the bedside, and this is your Fallon sign. So Fallon sign, when you flex both wrists in this manner and you press them against each other, you're going to get the same manifestations of pain, tingling, and paresthesias in the distribution of the median nerve, which is the thumb, the index finger, the middle finger, and half of the ring finger. This is diagnostic of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now look at the Fallon sign. If you do this, it actually looks funny. So the Fallon sign is funny while tinal sign letter T is to tap. Now here is your long thoracic nerve. And this muscle here is your serratus anterior. I want everyone heading to the boards or preparing for an exam to remember the long thoracic nerve supplies the serratus anterior. Now, if you have injury to the long thoracic nerve, you will get the famous winging of the scapula. Now, don't forget, the serratus anterior is supplied by the long thoracic nerve. And here is an illustration showing you the winging of the scapula. So if a patient has injury to the long thoracic nerve, you instruct them to push against a wall, the scapular bone, okay, the scapula is going to pop out, giving you the winging of the scapula. Now, this is the serratus anterior, and this is the muscle supplied by the long thoracic nerve. Now, what about axillary nerve injury? This usually occurs when there's a fracture of the surgical neck of the humerus. As you can see here, this is the surgical neck. This is the axillary artery. And this is the axillary nerve, very close to the area or the vicinity of the axillary area and the surgical neck. So if you have a fracture of the surgical neck, you would damage the axillary nerve as well as the circumflex arteries here. Now, let's mention the quadrangular space. Now, what should we remember regarding the quadrangular space? It's the boundaries, subscapularis, humerus, teres major, and the triceps. So this blue area here, this is the quadrangular space. This is the surgical neck of the humerus, which is the lateral border. Inferiorly, it's a teres major. Medially, the long head of the triceps. Now, what's inside this quadrangular space? It's the axillary nerve, this yellow structure here, and it's the posterior humeral circumflex artery there. So these are the contents of the quadrangular space. This is something you must memorize for your upcoming exam. So if you have axillary nerve injury, you're going to injure the contents of the quadrangular space, which is the axillary nerve and the posterior humeral circumflex. So don't forget, if you have a fracture of the surgical neck of the humerus, then it is the axillary nerve that is injured and the contents of the quadrangular space, which is your posterior humeral circumflex and the axillary nerve, they will be injured. Now, heads up. If a case of ill-fitted crutches comes out in the boards, it's actually not the axillary nerve that is injured. It is the radial nerve which is injured in ill-fitted crutches. Now, don't forget that if you have 
injury to the axillary nerve, then this will lead to deltoid atrophy. As you can see in this illustration, there's atrophy of the deltoid muscle, and this is associated with axillary nerve injury. Now, what about the ulnar nerve? If the ulnar nerve is injured, then you present on physical exam with the claw hand. This is an illustration, an illustration showing you the claw hand. Finger number one, the thumb, index, middle finger, and half of the ring finger, that is median nerve, the remaining half of the ring finger and the in, in the pinky. This is your ulnar nerve. Now, some other nerves to prepare for in any standard board exam or quiz. The thoracodorsal nerve. This is also known as the middle subscapular nerve. It is the thoracic thoracodorsal nerve that supplies the latissimus dorsi. Now, as you can see here, this is the latissimus dorsi. The nerve supply is the thoracodorsal nerve. Now, what about the rotator cuff? Oh, we know this is going to come out. What are the muscles that comprise the rotator cuff? We have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, we have the subscapularis, and the teres minor. Supra, infra, sub, and the teres minor. Now, tip, it's the teres minor, not the teres major. Now, what about the froment sign? I can smell this in the exam and I can see this in my crystal ball. The froment sign is what is illustrated in this picture. When pinching a piece of paper between the thumb and the index finger, the thumb IP joint will flex if the adductor pollicis muscle is weak. So, your froment sign is testing the weakness of your adductor pollicis muscle. And if this sign is positive, then this is indicative of ulnar nerve injury. Now, another thing we have to remember is this. You're heading to your exams, the froment sign, diagnostic of ulnar nerve palsy. What muscle is weak? The pinch grip, that's the adductor pollicis. Now, another thing I see in my crystal ball is the Finkelstein test. As you can see, it's being demonstrated here. Okay, the Finkelstein test. This is diagnostic of Dequervain's tenosynovitis. So, Finkelstein sign is diagnostic of Dequervain's tenosynovitis. Now, another thing I see in my crystal ball is what nerve is involved, which will explain why chest pain is referred to the medial side of the arm as well as the armpits. Now, please don't forget this is the intercostal brachial nerve. So when someone is having a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, the dermatome of the heart is T1 up to T4. Intercostal brachial nerve, this nerve here, is T2. So that will explain the referred pain radiating where? To the medial side of the arm and the armpit. So if you look at this area here, shaded in pink, this is the distribution of the intercostal brachial nerve, which is T2, area of the medial side of the arm, as well as the armpit. Now winding down, we have the Volkmann's contracture. Zoom into the picture and bring this with you to the boards. In Volkmann's contracture, this is usually encountered when you have a supracondylar fracture. When the brachial artery is injured, secondary to a supracondylar fracture, again, the brachial artery, the patient will develop ischemia. And this ischemic contracture, which is a permanent flexion contracture, involving the hand and the wrist, giving a claw-like deformity. This is known as Volkmann's ischemic contracture. And winding down, we have the Poitrin's contracture, which is the thickening of the palmar aponeurosis. Now, don't forget, the Poitrin's contracture is usually seen in uremia. And of course, we have the famous 
tennis elbow, which we call lateral epicondylitis, and its counterpart in the exam, the golfer's elbow, which is medial epicondylitis. Tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis, while golfer's elbow is medial epicondylitis. And lastly, for this video, take note of this famous area where most of us extract blood from our patients. This is your cubital fossa. This is the lateral epicondyle. This is the medial epicondyle. If you make an imaginary line to connect both epicondyles, that forms the base. On the medial side, you have the pronator teres, and on the lateral side, you have the brachial radialis. So these are the borders of the cubital fossa. This is very important because the axillary artery enters the cubital fossa, and once it exits the cubital fossa, it will now become the radial artery, which will pass through the anatomical snuff box, and it will become the ulnar artery. So with this, I hope you enjoyed the video. Take time, repeat it as many times as you want. Share it with your friends who are taking the board exam, preparing for an exam in anatomy in med school, or you simply just want to learn about anatomy. This is Doc Toom, your master guru, saying thank you, God bless, and good luck in your exams. Thank you.